Green light for five franchised bus companies in the city to raise their fares. Three Shenzhou 16 astronauts sent to the Tiangong space station in orbit. And NATO peacekeepers in Kosovo injured in clashes with Serb protesters. Good evening and welcome to TVB News. The chief executive in council today approved the fare increase applications of five franchised bus companies ranging from 3.9% to 7%. Such changes will be implemented on June 18th. Memo Sangai reports. Starting from June, the public will pay high bus fares after the government approved the five franchised operators to raise their charges. For fares of Longwen Bus and Kowloon Motor Bus, the raise is 4.2% and 3.9% respectively, about 50 and 60% less than the company's proposed increases. While the urban routes of City Bus and New World First Bus will increase their fares by an average 4.9%. Meanwhile, the airport and North Lanta routes of City Bus will see an increase of 4.2%. Among them, New Lanta Bus has the highest fare increase, 7%. The Secretary for Transport and Logistics believes the adjustments are affordable to the public. 90% of passengers, they would pay less than uh, 50 cents for each trip. And also, nearly all the passengers, they uh, do not need to pay more than $1 per trip. So I think that would be uh, affordable to general public. The secretary said there are rational reasons behind the bus fare approval. When we talk about the, 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 uh, the, the fare increase, it's important that uh, uh, it should be affordable at the, uh, to passengers at one hand. On the other hand, we have to maintain the financial sustainability of the bus company. The AB lawmaker at Learn hopes the bus companies can make things fairer after raising their fares. Now there is a rise in the bus fare. We hope that the bus companies can make an effort in giving back to the society. For example, we hope that uh, the Bravo bus can implement the two-way section fare mechanism, which is allowing the passengers to swipe the octopus card as they uh, get on the bus and also swiping the octopus card when they get off the bus. For that, uh, we can just pay for the service that we are using. However, Baptist University's Associate Professor of School of Business, Billy Mark, believes such fare adjustments need to be in line with the bus's competitiveness, adding residents will not want to see a decline in services. Mimos Nai, TVB News. The Hong Kong Franchise Bus Employees General Union has urged Kowloon Motor Bus Company to increase its employees' base salary by at least 7% to help them cope with inflation. The General Union, working alongside the Federation of Hong Kong Transportation and Logistics Industry Union, surveyed about 1,000 KMB employees between February and May. Over half of the respondents were dissatisfied with their current salaries. Moreover, almost 80 percent of them thought the retirement age should be extended from 60 to 65, which would help relieve the manpower shortage problem. It will be the 34th anniversary of the June 4th incident this Sunday. Chief Executive John Lee didn't directly warn against acts of mourning for the incident, but said the police will take action against any violations of the law. Police will take action uh, resolutely, particularly in regard to public order activities. So everybody uh, should uh, act in accordance with law and think of uh, what they do so as to be ready to face the consequences. On Monday, Secretary for Security Chris Tang said the police would arrest anyone who takes advantage of the June 4th anniversary to threaten national security. 
Executive Council member Ronnie Tong, meanwhile, said there is no problem for the public to mourn for the occasion, but there should not be any criminal intent. The CE was also asked if he could attend the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, meeting this November, which will be held in the United States. Lee is still facing U.S. sanctions. He said APEC is an international organization which doesn't belong to any country. He added, according to APEC conventions, the organizers has the responsibility to invite members to attend. Three Chinese astronauts who were sent into orbit this morning have now joined three others on board the Tiangong space station as part of a crew rotation. This is the fifth manned mission to the Chinese space outpost since 2021. The launch of the Shenzhou 16 spacecraft today will see the space station enter its application and development phase. Its focus will now move to scientific research and experiments. Daniel Rao reports. The spacecraft Shenzhou-16 and its three passengers lifted off atop a Long March 2F rocket from the Zhou Chuen Satellite Launch Center in the Gobi Desert in northwest China at 9.31 a.m. Beijing time. About 10 minutes after liftoff, it separated from the carrier rocket and entered the predetermined orbit. The spacecraft successfully docked with the radial port of the space station's core module Tianhe at 4.29 p.m. Beijing time today. The whole process took approximately 6.5 hours. The astronauts on Shenzhou 16 will replace the three-member crew of the Shenzhou 15, who arrived at the space station in late November last year. Leading the Shenzhou 16 mission is 56-year-old Jinghai Peng, a senior spacecraft pilot from China's first batch of astronaut trainees in the late 1990s. He had traveled to space on three previous occasions, including two trips as mission commander. Jing flew with Zhu Yangzhu and Gui Hai Chao, both 36 and part of China's third batch of astronauts. The mission is their first spaceflight. Former military university professor Zhu will serve as spaceflight engineer. Gui, a professor at Beihang University, will serve as the payload specialist on the mission, managing science experiments at the Tiangong space station. The astronauts will conduct large-scale in-orbit tests and experiments in various fields. They will stay in orbit for five months. They are expected to make discoveries in the study of novel quantum phenomena, high-precision space-time frequency systems, the verification of general relativity, and the origin of life. China has already announced plans to expand its permanently inhabited space outpost. Beijing is expected to launch one more crewed mission to the orbiting outpost this year. China is also due to launch a space telescope the size of a large bus by the end of 2023. Known as Xunqian, or surveying the heavens in Mandarin, the orbital telescope will boast a field of view 350 times wider than that of the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched 33 years ago. Danarel, TVB News. 25 NATO peacekeepers in northern Kosovo have been injured in clashes with Serb protesters. This as they tried to take over the offices of one of the municipalities where ethnic Albanian mayors took up posts last week. 52 Serbs were injured in the clashes, three seriously. Matthew Bray reports. These are soldiers of K4, the Kosovo Stabilization Force, clashing with ethnic Serbs in Zvikan, 45 kilometers north of the capital, Pristina. It is the latest violence as tensions soared over the weekend, with Serbia putting its military on high alert and sending more troops to the border. Kosovo declared independence from Belgrade in 2008. Belgrade has never recognized that move. Hungarian and Italian K-4 soldiers were injured as Serbs threw tear gas and stun grenades. These clashes are caused by Albanian mayors moving into offices after Serbs boycotted local elections last month. Serb officials resigned en masse in November 2022. There are constant tensions between Pristina and Serbs who live in the north and maintain close ties with Belgrade. Serbs do not have problem with Albanians. We are facing the problem with the regime of Fabian Kurti, who is doing everything to make chaos here and to create chaos for Serbs, Albanians and all of them. So you can also stop him because he wants to be big or small Zelensky or something like that. Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic urged Serbs in Kosovo not to get into clashes with NATO soldiers. Not because there was anything to lose, but it plays into the hands of Kosovo Prime Minister Albin Kurti. Ethnic Albanians make up more than 90% of the population in Kosovo, 
The northern Serbs have long demanded the implementation of an EU-brokered 2013 deal for the creation of an association of autonomous municipalities. The United States and its allies, which strongly back Kosovo's independence, rebuked Pristina on Friday, saying imposing mayors in Serb-majority areas without popular support undercut efforts to normalize relations. Another player is Russia, which doesn't recognize Kosovo as an independent state. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, speaking in Kenya, acknowledged the Serb army was on combat alert and emphasized in his words, a large eruption is brewing up in the center of Europe. Only this time he wasn't referring to Ukraine. Matthew Bray, TVB News. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez unexpectedly called a snap general election on Monday after left-wing parties were rooted in a regional and local elections. The panic move by Sanchez caught most of his government and even some members of his inner circle by surprise. Prior to Sunday's debacle, Sanchez had been insisting he would complete a four-year term, indicating a poll would be held in December. In Sunday's vote, the opposition conservative Popular Party won big as Spain took a major swing to the right. The poor showing by the socialists and its coalition partner was a dire assessment of how Spaniards feel towards the leftist coalition. The vote will take place on July 23rd. Uganda's president, Yoweri Museveni, signed one of the world's toughest anti-LGBTQ laws on Monday, which includes the death penalty for serial offenders and those who transmit a terminal illness such as HIV or AIDS through gay sex. Same-sex relations were already illegal in Uganda, as in more than 30 other African countries, but the new law goes further. There has been condemnation from mainly Western nations over the new law, with threats of sanctions against the country. Tracy Furness has more. Ugandan human rights lawyers and activists filed a petition against the new law which stipulates capital punishment for those repeatedly engaging in homosexual acts. The law also decrees a 20-year prison sentence for those promoting homosexuality. But petitioners say the new law is marred with procedural issues. This Act of Parliament has a number of flaws that we are highlighting in our petition. Um, and one of the main flaws is that the, petition, that, that, that the Act was passed without adequate and meaningful public participation. The bill, um, by criminalizing what we call consensual same-sex activity among adults basically goes against key provisions of the Constitution, including violating the right to equality and non-discrimination under Article 20 and 21 of the Constitution. It also violates uh, the right to dignity, which is under Article 24 of the Constitution. International rights group Amnesty International has joined dozens of other groups in condemning the law, saying it will affect the LGBTQ community across the region. We see that the more uh, states are sponsoring these bills, um, uh, these hateful uh, legislations, uh, the more the LGBT communities is impacted. Uh, and also that affect as well, you know, how uh, other politicians and other countries are, are following suit. So yeah, this bill, um, um, as is signed now uh, uh, into law by President Museveni, uh, is, um, uh, is having real consequences on the LGBTQ individuals in uh, Uganda, but also across the region. The White House condemned the Ugandan legislation. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Monday that the White House would consider visa restrictions against Ugandan officials and others for the abuse of human rights. And U.S. President Joe Biden directed the White House National Security Council to evaluate the implications of the law and on all aspects of U.S. engagement with Uganda, including the emergency plan for AIDS relief and other forms of assistance. Tracy Furness, TVB News. Still ahead on tonight's news. Two Moscow buildings attacked by drones as Russia launches another air raid on Kiev. A survey finds one in five kids in Hong Kong suffers from astigmatism. And this year's Shaw Prize winners announced.
Welcome back to TVB News. Russia launched another pre-dawn air raid on Kiev, killing at least one person. Ukraine authorities say at least 20 drones were shot down. Moscow said it was also subject to a drone attack, though officials say the damage was insignificant. Nazvi Karim has more. Kiev in the early hours. A light show depicting the colors of war, but failing to lift the darkness of death and destruction for the residents of Kiev on the ground. A third straight night of drone attacks on the Ukrainian capital left one dead and at least three injured after an apartment building was hit and set ablaze. Thousands of residents sought shelter in subways and other makeshift underground bunkers. Ukrainian officials say more than 20 Iranian-made drones were shot down, having had to deal with almost 100 of the suicide weapons since Saturday. President Volodymyr Zelensky hailed the effectiveness of the U.S.-supplied Patriots air defense system, which he said performed a 100 percent intercept rate. Moscow did not comment on the Kyiv attacks, but said at least a third of a Ukrainian air base was destroyed in the western region of Kimilnetsky. Ukraine acknowledged a runway was damaged and five aircraft were taken out of service. The nightly barrage on Kyiv is seen as an attempt by Moscow to erode Ukrainian morale ahead of an expected counteroffensive in the eastern region that has been months in the planning. The drone attacks, though, are not confined to just one capital. Russia said it shot down several drones as they approached Moscow and two buildings were damaged. Where the attacks came from is as yet unknown. Meanwhile, Igor Zhovfa, Zelensky's chief diplomatic advisor, said outside attempts to negotiate peace will fail unless it involves Russia withdrawing from captured land. That cannot be a Brazilian peace plan, a Chinese peace plan, a South Africa peace plan, when you're talking about the war in Ukraine. Item 6 is about the withdrawal of Russian troops from the whole territory. With no peace plan in sight, Zelensky is hoping that South Korea will provide military equipment such as anti-aircraft systems. South Korea so far provided humanitarian aid, with President Yoon suk yeol reluctant to supply weapons. Zelensky insists anti-aircraft systems are meant for defense and therefore do not count as weapons. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. Locally, a Chinese university study has found that one in five kids in Hong Kong suffers from moderate to severe astigmatism, an eye problem that causes blurry vision. The study shows genetics as one of the main factors behind astigmatism. Veronica Lin reports. Astigmatism is the most common refractive error worldwide, even more common than myopia and hyperopia. It's caused by an irregular shape in the cornea or lens. Globally, 15% of kids and 40% of adults suffer from astigmatism. While there are a number of factors that could lead to astigmatism, researchers at the Chinese University of Hong Kong observed that there is a strong correlation between parental and child astigmatism. They found that if parents have astigmatism of 100 diopters, on average, their child will also have 80 diopters of astigmatism. Astigmatism is particularly prevalent among kids in Hong Kong. From 2015 to 2022, CUHK collected data from around 3,700 kids aged 6 to 8 in Hong Kong and found that around 60% had astigmatism of 50 diopters or more. For the environmental risk factors, we will include the, outside, uh, the outdoor activities. Usually it's uh, reduced outdoor activities and long time uh, near reading or long time near working. So these are these two factors are also the risk factors for myopia as well because uh, previous studies have also shown that a myopia or high myopia is also a risk factor for uh, astigmatism. While astigmatism is not entirely preventable, there are ways to slow down its progression, such as alternating between reading and spending time outdoors. Eye checkups and treatment are also essential. Treatment can include wearing glasses, contact lenses, as well as laser surgery. Professors at CUHK said the golden period for treating astigmatism will be before eight years old. If left untreated, the child may develop a lazy eye. Frank Lin, TVB News. Seven scientists have been named this year's Shaw Prize winners. The mathematical prize is awarded in equal shares to Chinese scholar Yao Xingtong, as well as a professor at the University of Chicago. Veronica Lin again. This marks the 20th year of the Shaw Prize. This year, 
the Shaw Prize in Mathematical Sciences is awarded in equal shares to Ukrainian-born University of Chicago professor Vladimir Drinfield, as well as Tsinghua University scholar Yaoxing Tang. That's for their contributions related to mathematical physics, arithmetic, and differential geometry. Yao was born in 1949 in Shantou, China, and studied at the Chinese University of Hong Kong before earning his Ph.D. from the University of California, Berkeley. He has been a distinguished professor at large at CUHK since 2003. The Life Science and Medicine Prize is awarded in equal shares to German scholar Patrick Kramer, as well as Spanish-born American professor Eva Nogales. They are honored for pioneering the visualization at the level of atoms and protein machines responsible for gene transcription. The Astronomy Prize is awarded in equal shares to Australian Matthew Bales, British-born American professor Duncan Lorimer, and American professor Maura McLaughlin for their discovery of fast radio bursts. The laureates will be awarded a medal and a certificate, and each prize also bears a monetary award of 1.2 million U.S. dollars, or roughly 9.4 million Hong Kong dollars. The award ceremony will be held on November 12th. It will be the first face-to-face -face ceremony since the pandemic began. All Shaw Prize winners between 2020 and 2023 can also receive their awards on that day. Veronica Lin, TV News. And that's the news. Thanks for watching.